Good morning, everyone. I am Sayyida Arisha Zadi, PhD student at Dr. A.Q. Khan Institute of Biotechnology and Genetic Engineering, University of Karachi, and media representative of OWSG Pakistan National Chapter. I welcome you all in today's session, which is on the like virtual lecture series on challenges for young women scientists embarking a career in science. Today we have two speakers, and uh, the first guest or the speaker of the today of today's session is uh, Dr. Faria Fatma. She is assistant professor at uh, Department of Biosciences, Faculty of Life Sciences, Shahid Zulfikar Ali Bhutto Institute of uh, Science and Technology, Zebes. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. Assalamu alaikum everyone and good morning all of you. I hope you all are doing well and I am thankful to Ms. Arisha for introducing me. Uh, it is really an honor for me and really an honor and privilege for me to be a part of this lecture series on Challenges for Young Women Embarking a Career in Science uh, by Organization for Women in Science for the Developing Countries, OWSD. And uh, to, it is really an honor. Uh, I and I am here to share my journey of becoming a reflexive researcher. Uh, re reflexivity is a term which, is, which explains the ongoing mutual shaping between a researcher and research. And I don't think that I have aced this trade right now. Uh, 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 and the process is still going on of becoming a reflexive researcher. I try to become a reflexive researcher. I am Dr. Fari Fatma and I have done my BSc in biochemistry, MSc from biotechnology from, uh, in biotechnology and PhD in biotechnology. Uh, from Dr. Ekupan Institute of Biotechnology and Genetic Engineering, University of Karachi. Currently, I'm serving as an assistant professor at the uh, Department of Biosciences, Faculty of Life Sciences, Shahid Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, Institute of Science and Technology, Service. The journey of becoming a researcher uh, starts from a city uh, called Salala uh, in Oman. My, uh, uh, there are, we are three siblings, we are three sisters basically. Uh, my eldest sister is currently a school teacher. Uh, the elder one is currently serving as an assistant professor at Kibji, and then I am the youngest one. Uh, my initial schooling was from Pakistan School uh, Salala. And I was, I was born and raised in Oman and then my initial schooling was from the Pakistan School Salala. I completed and the initial schooling was done there. Then I came to Pakistan and completed my matriculation from Sazaya Degree College, Festival. Then uh, I intermediate. Then uh, my intermediate was from the Government Degree College for Women, Nazmabad. At this point, I will take a break and I would like to acknowledge and thank all my teachers of the initial, uh, which paved my my way, which which inspired me to love science, which inspired, who inspired me to work hard at the initial schooling level. Because of those teachers, I am sitting here and I am, I am, I love science because of all those teachers. Uh, without them, I won't be able to stand or sit, sit here. I won't be able to, uh, I won't be able to uh, at the place where I am. At this point, my one of my teachers usually uh, suggests my father that do not confine your daughters, do not confine your daughters and let them free, release them and let them free and swim in the sea of knowledge. Which my father used to recall us, which my father used to repeat those words 
continuously when whenever we me and my sisters achieve anything in our life my father used to repeat those words i think those tiny words those tiny sentences they big those tiny words have uh, uh, made us to achieve what we are what we are like i have done phd my sister has also done phd they those words it is also because, it is all because of those words and those inspirations those appreciations from teachers and from parents because of, because of those tiny repetitive words that hammering uh, the day when i first entered the university i know that my uh, that achieving masters or getting uh, uh, getting a degree is not my aim i am here to get phd i am here to get a uh, higher degree in the university when i got admission in the university i got admission in department of botany and to be very honest botany was not my cup of tea uh, i worked hard and got transferred uh, got transferred to biochemistry my major then became the biochemistry then in third year uh, i got admission in uh, biotechnology as uh, msc quickly <clears throat> all this time only thing was only my only aim was to get better better with time i worked hard i worked really hard during all this time these are some of the good memories and in this process of uh, getting degree and in this process of working hard i met really good people who inspired me in many different ways who taught me in many different ways so here are some memories with them uh, which i really cherish then after completing my msc i got admission in uh, mp leading to phd program at uh, dr ak khan institute of biotechnology and genetic engineering uh, and completed my phd here title of my phd is the genetic variations in the genes of p53 pathway and tumor growth regulator an association with the susceptibility to breast cancer and this research was conducted under the supervision of dr saima selim who is serving as an associate professor at university at kibji university of karachi uh, a little bit about my research what i have done in the uh, in my uh, thesis uh, basically uh, p53 is called as the Uh, there are basically there are two aspects of my research: P53 pathway, one of the pathway P53 apoptosis, and the chemokine tumor growth pathway. Uh, P53 is called as the guardian of the human genome, and it has been involved in multiple processes at one time. One of the process or one of the pathway of P53 is apoptosis, which is called as the uh, program cell death. P53 pathway P53 is a tumor suppressor protein, and they it the uh, apoptosis which are mediated by P53. There are two types of apoptosis: intrinsic apoptosis and the extrinsic apoptosis. Intrinsic when the apoptosis is mediated by an internal factor, it is called as the intrinsic, and if it is mediated by the external factor, it is called as the extrinsic. Internal as uh, the term internal and external. Uh, means about the uh, environment of the cells, internal environment and the external environment of the cell. Uh, let's take a insight about the intrinsic and the extrinsic apoptotic pathway. This is the cell, and it is in the, it is the internal environment, and it is the this is the external environment of the cell. when a cell attains a damage uh, any sort of damage either it is the oxidative stress or it is the damage to dna or any chemical agent or any any type of uh, uh, stress uh, if a cell is under any type of stress different proteins are different proteins are activated which try to overcome that stress and if that stress damage the cell they try to repair that damage and if that is that damage is no unrepairable then this then those proteins try to lyse or uh, take that cell towards the towards death so those uh, uh, two of those proteins are dak and dak back and back 
they are the good proteins. They prevent from the cancerous formation. They, they prevent the formation of cancer. They prevent uh, the uh, cells to, uh, they, they uh, basically, they are involved in maintaining the good quality of cells. Back and back signals the mitochondria to release cytochrome C. This cytochrome C activates the procaspase 3 and convert into caspase 3. Caspase is, uh, is an enzyme as the name itself uh, implies and this enzyme is involved in cleaving and uh, uh, in cleaving the cells and uh, uh, taking the cells towards the dead. So this is the intrinsic pathway. And this pathway is regulated by pro-apoptotic yeah, anti and pro-apoptotic factors for BCL and BCL cell. They inhibit the back and back if the cell is under normal condition, its quality is maintained. So BCL2 and BCL cell prevent these apoptotic proteins, uh, back and back. So, uh, so this is the, these are the regulators of the intrinsic apoptotic pathway. And when the cells, uh, when a, a death ligand or uh, any factor externally attaches the cell, they uh, uh, initiate, uh, those factors initiate the apoptotic pathway from the external, externally and convert the pro-caspase 8 and pro-caspase is A and caspase 10. They are, uh, they are the family of caspases, caspase 3, 8, 10. It is a family of caspases and they are involved in the apoptosis. So uh, uh, caspase 8 and 10 are also regulated. They are also regulators of the extrinsic apoptotic pathway. So my study was focused on one intrinsic BCL2 and two extrinsic caspase 8 and caspase 10 uh, regulators of Apoptosis. And when these apoptotic pathways, when the uh, caspase 8, 10, and 3, they, uh, they undergo different cascade of reactions and undergo and make the cells to lines. The other, the next part of the, the other part of my study is about the chemokine mediated regulation of tumor growth. Uh, uh, apart from the organ vicinity, I always wonder that why most of the time breast cancer uh, uh, metastasized to lymph nodes, liver, or lungs, or at times uh, why most of the times oral cancer metastasized to larynx, pharynx. Uh, why, apart from the organ vicinity, why the, why is is this happening always? There are some other factors as well. So this part of my study focused on that metastatic pathway, on that uh, it uh, tried to infer, it tried to find out a small piece of that puzzle, uh, which mediate the metastasis, which mediate the tumor growth, which mediate the metastasis, right in the growth of tumor. So uh, the cells at the, uh, the cells of, these are the cells at the secondary tumor. And And these are the cells at the primary tumor site. Uh, let's talk about the primary and the secondary tumor site. Primary tumor site is that where the cancer originally originates, uh, originate from the very first time. And the secondary tumor site is the other part where the cancer go, metastasize, spread, and home itself. So uh, 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 it is all because of the morphology of those cells. They are different from each other of cells at the primary side and cells at the secondary side. They are very different from each other. So uh, uh, the cells at the secondary side produce a cytokine, chemokines basically. Chemokines are the small peptides which are produced by the cells to communicate with each other. So these chemokines are the, uh, the receptors of these peptides, small peptides are present on the cells of primary tumors. Uh, because of this affinity, this receptor ligand interaction, the cells from the primary tumor site are attracted at the secondary site. This is the one of the reasons that why breast cancer always, yeah, most of the times, metastasize to the lymph nodes or the liver or the lungs. And when, they, uh, when the cells from the uh, uh, primary tumor site attract and come and home and reside and bind with the secondary site, they start producing more um, chemokines or more uh, cytokines to attract more cells. 
In this way, the tumor from the primary site not only resides at the secondary site, but they also uh, uh, help other cells together and increase in their mass. Like if, if I would say in a layman lay term, they try to increase their T. Now that these cells from the, this is the primary tumor side and the secondary tumor cells, uh, they start creating their microenvironment. Microenvironment is very important. Uh, it is important for the maintenance of tissue homeostasis. Like uh, 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 the cells of the liver and the cells of the lung, they have very different morphology. They have very different functions. They have very different proteins. And they, they, they are very different from each other. There, but there are chances uh, why it is not happening that lung cells can come and reside in the liver. It is because of these microenvironments. This microenvironment has a very important role. It not only prevents the cell from the foreign environment to come, but also if a cell is come, if, if cell has entered this microenvironment, it degrades or it lies that cell. Now, this microenvironment in this way it maintains the tissue homeostasis. But in cancer, this homeostatic mechanism fails at times. This microenvironment is open and free for every type of cell to enter and reside in that in that area. So now these cells are producing more chemokines and more chemokines, and they are gathering the cells of similar cells, similar kind, yani ke those cells which are producing the receptors of those chemokines. And then more cells are recruiting uh, in this way. They also recruit the immune cells. The immune system is uh, uh, supposed to uh, overcome the cancer, supposed to suppress the cancer. But in this case, cancer modify them and they add up those immune cells into their team and increase its mass. Now, this new mass of the tumor tissue, initially it was more mo uh, motile or mobile. Now it start penetrating into the new environment and uh, producing new blood vessels and angiogenesis. In this way, the cancer is spread from one organ to another by the help of these chemokines, this is, which is the language, which is the, which are the small peptides which are used uh, between the cells to communicate. Similar type of a mechanism is also observed in microbes as well. When they are under stress, they aggregate, they try to aggregate, they communicate with each other by the help of these uh, peptides. Now, the regulators, now we have understood the both mechanisms of P53 pathway for process and the tumor growth metastatic pathway. Uh, so, so the regulators which have focused on, as I have initially mentioned, that the regulators which I have focused on, on the apoptosis is the caspase 8, 10 genes of caspase 8, 10, BCL2, and CCR5, CC chemokine receptor 5. It is one of the receptor of those chemokines which are which are used in the communication between the cells. So caspase 8 and 10 are the regulators of extrinsic apoptosis. BCL2 is the regulator of intrinsic apoptosis, and CCR5 is the regulator of the metastasis or tumor growth. So this polymorphism which I have targeted of uh, CAS8 gene is D302H. It is commonly called as D302H along with its reference number, RS number. Uh, and uh, this uh, this change is present in the exon 8 exon 8 of cas8 gene while the uh, polymorphism which i have targeted of cas10 is the v410i the, uh, and the name of these common names have also indicated that v410i v is for valine and i is for isoleucine so 410 at the 410th amino acid of this protein uh, caspase 10 protein the valine is replaced by the isoleucine and in caspase 8 uh, protein uh, at 302nd uh, amino acid, the glutamate is replaced by the histamine CD, which have com completely different uh, impact on its uh, morphology, on, on the structure of, the, of, the, of these proteins and eventually regulation of the process. In BCL2, we have the minus 938, the polymorphism which I have targeted in BCL2 gene, which is B cell lymphoma 2 gene. It was firstly identified in the BCL lymphoma, and the second is the uh, second uh, number two is because of its uh, um, uh, 
uh, number of uh, I, when it was discovered. So it, it is minus 938. This minus is because of it is this polymorphism is present in the upstream, uh, upstream of the gene. The gene, uh, the coding region of gene start from the APG, which is the star codon, and then uh, the PCL2 protein is formed. Uh, uh, this uh, polymorphism is located 93, 9, 938 nucleotide before that uh, star codon. So this is the regulator of intrinsic for uh, intrinsic uh, apoptosis. Then we have the regulator CCR chemokine receptor five, CC chemokine receptor five. Chemo, there are different types of chemokines. Chemokines are those cytokines, which are uh, as we have understood, the cytokines are the those proteins which are produced by the cells to communicate. Uh, and under different stimulus, these proteins are produced. So chemokine, a CC chemokine, chemokines are those proteins which are produced under the stimulus of different chemicals, uh, different chemical stimulus. And there are four different four different types of chemokines and one of the chemokines is cc chemokine because it contains two cysteine residues in the in its the protein structure in in the core domain or in the core at the active site of its uh, protein structure and uh, ccr5 it is a receptive receptor of though of that cc chemokine uh, I have targeted two polymorphisms, uh, two variations, genetic variations of CCR5, uh, 59029. It is, uh, it is the common name of this polymorphism and it is located in the first exon of CCR5. Uh, and uh, uh, CCR5 delta 32 delta indicates the deletion. It is a 32 base pair deletion in the CCR5 gene. And because of the, this deletion, either the CC, CCR5 function to attract the cell or uh, it is a uh, it has a dual role ccr5 has a dual role if it is formed if the if if the normal protein is formed uh, it either helps to suppress the tumor or if the if this normal protein is formed it either uh, helps the immune cells it attracts the immune cells so it has a dual role and i have found it inconsistent result throughout the uh, population in the world. Moreover, the CCR5 has another crucial role. Uh, this It is involved HIV, usually human uh, immunodeficiency virus, HIV, use two receptors. Uh, one of the receptors which HIV use to enter the cell is CCR5. And there is a population in a world. Uh, I think it's the prevalence of frequency is, le is less than 0.5. It varies across the globe, uh, but generally, if I talk about generally, it is 0.5 to 0.8 percent uh, population of the world which are resistant to HIV because they have this deletion in their CCR5. So their receptor is not formed per properly. It is unable to transport it to the cell membrane, and that's why they are unable to, uh, 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 HIV is unable to infect the, those cells. So uh, I have targeted these all these polymorphisms of uh, these regulators, the regulate, regulators of these genes, genes of the regulators. For this research, we have collaborated with different institutes uh, like Institute of Biomedical and Genetic Engineering, IBG, which is a sister institute of KIBG, Civil Hospital Karachi, Jinnah Post Graduate Medical Center, and Bakai Institute of Oncology for the sake of collection of blood samples as it is a case control cross-sectional study in which we have to we need to collect the blood samples of breast cancer patients diagnosed diagnosed breast cancer patients for once in their whole tre uh, treatment plan in their whole treatment span uh, the study subject samples and data collection. In this study, we have collected a total 487 female cases and they were compared with 453 controls. Uh, we also able to get four male cases and six controls. They were compared with the six controls. Yes, breast cancer also happens, occurs in males. And uh, uh, when I did the research about the prevalence or the incidence of breast cancer in male patients, it was found, I found that uh, uh, it is more often of likely it is more likely to associate with the uh, occupational habit of those uh, uh, males like uh, I have four male breast cancer cases and out of those four males two cases 
have these prolonged exposure of 25 to 30 years exposure of uh, to, uh, for the pesticides and those pesticides when they spray they do not use the proper ppe gloves or the eye protection or the mask because uh, they inhale that uh, pesticides and uh, the, those pesticides uh, they start mimicking the activity of estrogen in their body so these four males uh, and all of them are estrogen positive as well uh, along with these uh, cases, uh, these are the blood, sam blood samples, right? And along with these samples, I have also collected the data. Data was also required, uh, which includes the social history, uh, like ethnicity and psychometric features, like uh, uh, height, weight, body, and then demographic features, uh, demographic features of those individuals, and then the reproductive history, like the productive history of uh, individuals, individuals include like use of contraceptive uh, uh, pills, uh, uh, then um, age of parity. Parity is the age of a, a woman when she had first uh, when she had first baby. Uh, then uh, age of menopause, age of uh, uh, menarche. These are the different number of children. These are the different factors which are they are considered as the prognostic factors which have contributed a lot in the development of breast cancer and uh, 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 and the severity of the diseases and the uh, all the severity of the diseases. Uh, for this purpose, uh, as I have mentioned, that we have collected we have collected the blood blood from these patients. The five ml blood was collected from the venous uh, vein. And along with this, uh, we were also able to collect the uh, breast tissues of 100 cases. Uh, the breast tissues of 0.5 to 2 centimeter. For this, we have collaborated with the Institute of uh, Biotechnology and Genetic Engineering. FG, they have helped us to uh, get the blood uh, tissue samples of uh, uh, breast cancer cases. So, uh, so far, this is the, uh, these are the uh, subject selection and the rec uh, recruitment criteria. The plan of work includes uh, the sample collection. We collected the samples. Then those samples, uh, those samples were subjected to the DNA isolation. DNA was isolated and then PCR amplification uh, and the genotyping by RX protein. So uh, all the polymorphisms except the deletion, CCR5, Delta 32, except the deletion, all the polymorphisms of caspase 8, caspase 8, CAS10, uh, BCL2, and the CCR5, 59029, all were genotyped by the help of RFLP. First, the product, first, the targeted region polymorphic, uh, the region which contains the polymorphism was uh, amplified by the PCR. Then that, uh, 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 that amplified product was subjected to the restriction digestion. We have used the design in the program to restriction endonucleases, which cleave the site of the, which cleave at the polymorphic site. If the polymorphism is present, the enzyme will cut. If the polymorphism is not present, the enzyme will not be able to cut or vice versa. So in this way, we will be able to join genotype. And for deletion, uh, for the deletion, simple PCR amplification was done. Uh, as the deletion is a 32, as there is a 32 base pair deletion. So if, uh, if deletion is present, then we will get a product of 201 base pair right after PCR and if the deletion is not present then you'll get a product of 233 base pairs. So it is it is point we need do not need to have the uh, RSLP. Then the samples are subjected to electrophoresis which is one of the steps to observe the amplification. Then after that DNA sequencing was done. DNA sequencing is put, is very crucial in the genotyping based study because if you are targeting a polymorphism we don't know. There might be possibilities that there are other polymorphisms also present in that amplified region. For that purpose, we'll go for the uh, DNA sequencing. And un unfortunately, fortunately, uh, to get the other novel and rare uh, uh, polymorphisms along with the reported one, which I've targeted. Uh, 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 and I have confirmed those uh, uh, polymorphisms uh, through the thousand genome browser, which contain all the data of all the polymorphisms and the genetic variations present in the human genome. Ah, so findings of my study. Uh, uh, so far, uh, the findings of my study indicated that the CAS8 D302H, uh, CAS10 B410I, and the CCR5 59029. These three polymorphisms have protective effect against breast cancer. Well, uh, let me make it 
clear, easy, easier to understand. If a person is having this polymorphism, if a person is having H instead of D, if a person is having I instead of B or this polymorphism in CCR5 gene, he or she is, is heavy protection against the breast cancer. Either he or she cannot get the cancer or 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 uh, or or she or he, uh, he or she have the uh, better survival or the reduced uh, disease will occur with the reduced severity. Uh, then uh, the polymorphism of uh, then the polymorphism which was targeted, which is present in the uh, BCL2 promoted region of the upstream uh, BCL2 minus 938 uh, nucleotides before the start photon, it has the increased risk of breast cancer. If a person is having this change, he or she might get the breast cancer, might develop the breast cancer in the later stages, or uh, or he or she has has or have already developed. Okay, now the, uh, this deletion of CCR5 gene, uh, as I've all, already mentioned that this deletion has a dual role. Either they, this deletion, because of this deletion, CCR5 receptor won't be able to form completely properly and won't be able, uh, uh, as all the processing happens in the cytokine, uh, in, in the uh, cytoplasm, all the processing of the protein formation and its modification will occur in the cytoplasm and that, that protein is transported to the cell membrane where it will perform its function. So it is a receptor, it is present on the cell uh, membrane. So if a proper the uh, CCR5 receptor is not formed, it won't be able to transport it to the cell membrane and won't be able to function. Uh, uh, what is the function? Uh, attract the cells for the uh, chemokines, uh, uh, cytokines and chemokines uh, to attract the cells uh, uh, for the for the communication. So uh, it is a dual role. Uh, if the receptor is, uh, as I've mentioned, if it is formed, uh, if it is normally formed and without any uh, 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 dysfunctionality, uh, it, it might help in progression and it might not help it. And in our study, we have found that this deletion in CCR5 has increased the risk of breast cancer. So uh, uh, it, it has increased the uh, risk of breast cancer. So there might be some other factors which also contribute in this communication and spread in metastasis. Along with this, as I've mentioned, that the data was collected uh, for the uh, reproductive factors like menopause, age, age, at first parity, and these are all uh, different types of uh, receptor status like uh, ER, ER, estrogen positive, progesterone positive, or two positive or negative. All these factors have the prognostic effect, and it, it was found that they are potentially they have potential role in the formation of uh, breast cancer in our study samples. As a, and along with this, I've also found some rules. Uh, finding smoother mutations as well, which are under the process of membrane deposition. Uh, this was all about my research. Uh, let's talk about some real grounds. During my research, as all of you can relate with me, uh, research is not a smooth or straight line. It is a bumpy road. Uh, you have ups and downs. So uh, I'll talk about a little bit to motivate uh, some of young young scientists or my young fellows or young colleagues. Uh, I had a bad time in my research when I was not able to work for approximately more than one year. Yes, more than one year because of some unforeseen crisis. Then I started working on publication, but and unfortunately, I was not able to get my paper published uh, as uh, uh, the continuous process of review and rejection, review and rejection, and which obviously uh, demoted, demotivated me a lot. Uh, 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 I have not shared this with anyone yet, but the worst part of that phase was I was I want to share I I want to share that feeling, but I was not able to share them. So. Then uh, uh, after uh, this, but this was continuously, con uh, this process was going for one and one and a half year. So uh, then one of um, my team, uh, as we have a cancer group, so our group visited uh, Shogar Khan uh, Memorial Cancer Hospital Research Center, uh, its symposium, 16 Shogar Khan and Cancer Symposium. And there I got the best poster presentation award. So this was, 
a turning point point in that setback uh, it motivated me a lot uh, it helped me this was one of the best uh, uh, i would say it's one of the best presentations of mine um, uh, mine and it helped me a lot to overcome that uh, demotivation in that phase so all my advice to all the young fellows that whatever is happening right now just keep going everything will get to their places by the time have some patience and do your part continuously start doing your part that's it or up and anything else is not required from you just do your part these are my first two publications i cherish them a lot that's why i mentioned uh, uh, along with this all uh, uh, other publications are also on the way some are published and some are on the way so i cherish them a lot that's why i mentioned them mentioned uh, their uh and then uh, after the publication the journey of my research i would say that uh, end uh, and it uh, completed my thesis in 2019 but this is not the end it is the beginning of a new journey beginning of the new learning experience so far uh these are during my research and uh, like uh, during my research and all that uh, uh, time which i spent in gpg i have met some really good people and have spent a really 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 good great time with them uh, these are some uh, memories with and these people inspire me a lot these people uh, cher i cherish uh, spend uh, 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 i cherish the time which i have spent with them and uh, they all are they i am continuously learning with with them from uh, after this uh, i started working online uh, after uh, getting there was a gap of around 8 uh, to 9 months i would say when i completed my phd and i got, got the job there was a uh, there was a gap of 8 to 9 months in that time i started working online i started reviewing the thesis started reviewing the papers in different journals and all that process review uh, i started working as a reviewer in different journals so uh, that time was very uh, helpful uh, uh, that experience was very helpful for me then i would say that uh, god was has been very kind with me that i got job in uh, at zavis department of biosciences faculty of biosciences zavis uh, why because i got this job in february 2020 uh, right when the time when the lockdown started and uh, it was the time when most of the people are uh, uh, are getting unemployed they were losing their job and i got this job as uh, at that time so uh, in the zabis the new learning experience started now i started learning as a uh, uh, as a uh, as a teacher as a mentor i learned uh, as you all know ke learning is a continuous process we so i i learned from the students they know they know uh, students uh, they know how to uh, share their opinions how to be right in how to stick to their uh, opinions and how to stick to their uh, uh, things then uh, my colleagues uh, i have a, we have a very good and positive environment at the department of biosciences there is so uh, my fellow colleagues and they are it, it, i i'm still learning and uh, they all they, all of them have inspired me inspired me a lot so uh, Uh, at Zavis, I have been continuously involved in different, uh, uh, along with the teaching and the research activities. I have also been involved in some administrative work. Uh, they are also in evaluating the curriculum and redesigning and updating the curriculum. And uh, the courses which so far I have taught at Zavis in the span of almost uh, one one and a half year uh, are the cancer bio. I have taught different courses at MS and BS level, which include cancer biology, medical biotechnology, advanced. is in health biotechnology advanced molecular techniques and two courses of ecology biodiversity and evolution yes this is a very different from my domain i have a core hardcore uh, background of medical biotechnology and the environment and evolution and biodiversity it is very different it was very challenging for me but alhamdulillah uh, nothing is difficult if you keep on working hard on anything nothing is difficult for you
uh, along with this, I've organized different events at Zedis as well. Uh, uh, like uh, we have an annual research symposium, uh, which is called as the Bark. Uh, uh, along with this, I have conducted an online workshop on the research writing skills. Uh, uh, all these for the graduate, post -grad, graduate, undergraduate, and post graduate students, and an annual biosciences conference. Because of the COVID, we are able to, unable to. Uh, uh, organize these conferences or these event, events uh, in the campus, we have to go for the virtual and online work. Uh, the research which I have conducted at Zebis uh, is uh, there are current, current, currently there are three projects uh, which are uh, under my which are uh, which I which are uh, under my supervision. Two projects are ongoing in which uh, and all these projects are different BS and MS level as well. Uh, uh, the first uh, the undergoing which is, uh, the first project which is ongoing and under the completion is the identification and characterization of antibiotic resistance genes in staphylococcus aureus. So we are taking these staphylococcus aureus and trying to identify the antibiotic resistance and sensitive patterns on the basis of those genetic factors. And for this, we have collaborated with Dr. Ekufan Kibji, Dr. Ekufan Institute of Biotechnology and Genetic Engineering Kibji. Uh, the other my project which is which has just started is the genetic variations in the expression of pdl one gene and its association with the susceptibility to breast cancer. And this project is also uh, with the collaboration of our university of hospital, university of Ho university hospital. PDL1 is one of the ligand of those, uh, if you can recall that apoptotic pathway, which I've mentioned in the earlier slides, the extrinsic, extrinsic apoptotic pathway. So it was mediated by the PDL1 uh, program that ligand one. So uh, we are trying to identify the variations and expression of this gene. If a person is having this PDL1 gene expression. If you would able to enhance the expression of PDL1, then then patient have uh, the uh, better survival. Uh, 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 that patient would have the better survival and better response for different things, including drugs. So it is uh, it is a baseline study for an applied study. Then we have the upcoming project, which is uh, inshallah, which soon will be started in. In two to three months is the antibiotic resistant profiling of enterococcal species. So we are uh, trying to. Uh, it is basically a big project which I have divided into three different projects. So first part was on the Staphylococcus aureus, and the second part is on the enterococcal species. So uh, uh, in that we are we are we are trying to identify the resistance species. So this was the, this is my journey from the basic from the from childhood to becoming a professional and assistant professor. Uh, all I want to say that just believe in yourself and you can do wonders. One thing which I forgot to mention that after my matriculation from the intermediate to becoming a doctor, I financed my study by myself. This doesn't mean that my father is not a protective person. If my father doesn't care about me, this doesn't mean that he can't afford or he does not want to afford. That was my choice and he respected my choice. Uh, whenever I come up with things like that, he always say that, Faria, do whatever you want to do. I am there. I am standing behind you to support you. So as I say that behind every successful woman, there is a father who trusts her. But I would say that behind every successful woman, there are parents, her parents, her mother and father who stand behind her, who trusted her, who taught her, who prayed for her, who wishes for her, who make their dreams her dreams, who make her dreams their dreams. So just believe in yourself and you can do anything you want. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Faria. That was a wonderful talk and uh, you explained very everything in uh, uh, much needed detail and uh, you were amazing. So uh, I would like to ask the participants if they have any question, they can just uh, raise their hands and then turn on their mics and they can ask anything from Dr. Faria. 
because trust me i have lots of questions because i'm going through the same process right now so i have lots and lots of questions but i would like to say that if any participant have any question uh, they can ask okay let me start then so uh, dr faria the major thing in uh, the process of doing phd is the loss of motivation and there were some days that you just don't want to do anything you lost all the hope and you think that nothing is going anywhere how do you cope with that or how what do you suggest that what should one person do to avoid that uh arisha so far i don't think so i don't think myself that i would be able to suggest but what i did or what i think one should do that just keep going do not get stressed okay if, if i'm not able to do work if nothing is happen is happening uh, nothing is getting at the place just relax and keep going uh, like it is said na if you can't run just walk if you cannot walk just crawl but keep going on that's it everything will get its place by the time everything is uh, every everything will, will be fine inshallah everything will be fine inshallah and uh, my second question is that um, how uh, you overcome those hurdles and what do you think that students should do in terms of the scholarships in terms of uh, the opportunities uh, because usually we think that uh, let me finish this and then i'll move to that so uh, it's a constant it, it's a cycle it's a loop uh, you think that i no let me finish this and then i'll jump on to the next phase of the of my life so uh, what do you think that how we should overcome those things or uh, how we should move uh, past from those things uh, especially in term of career and also in term of <laughs> private life personal life uh, because uh, we usually what we do we hold on uh, put uh, things on hold for a very long time so what do you think uh, my personal advice is Uh, do not hold things for the sake of your phd because phd is not life it is a part of life and those personal things or those all those things which you are keeping hold that let me complete this then i'll go for this please don't do this uh, all things are the part of the life and everything will ha huh, you have to struggle there 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 might be chances you have to struggle you have to work hard for for a uh, for a quite number of days but don't hold anything for anything anything for the sake of your phd and do not procrastinate try we usually start to achieve the perfection we start procrastination uh, procrastination please do not procrastinate do whatever you want to do use your present time to your max that's it whatever you want you can do you can do like i am having i am uh, i am working in zabist I have a child. I am continuously applying for post doctoral positions. Uh, I might get in one month or two months, but I am currently currently, uh, and I will not take the students because I will. I am applying for post doc. I I I do not take the students for research because I am applying for post doc. That doesn't uh, sound sane. So just use your current time to your max. That and that hard work, that hard time, you'll cherish the time. it is the time it taught you which will which will teach you the most you will cherish that that time is very precious for you so just keep going and believe in yourself yes absolutely thank you so much and my next question was actually regarding to that that you are applying for the post doctoral scholarships uh, so in pakistan we have a trend that you should go for p ph you should go for foreign phd scholarships so i wanted to know that why you haven't applied for that or why you chose to do phd from pakistan instead of uh, any other uh, country uh, i applied i was also i applied also i applied for the phd and split phd in sandwich program but was unable to 
uh, God win one of those. This is the reason. Uh, but if you get the opportunity, please use it, avail it. And if you are not able to get the opportunity, then make the opportunity by yourself. Collaborate with other institutes, make a good work, worthwhile work. Because eventually that work is your identity that work will be your identity you will be known by that work yes absolutely you're right and we have a message in chat from uh, rimsha zahir ali she says that it was a wonderful presentation dr faria so thank you rimsha and uh, we also have a message from dr afshin aman she says, good to see you, dear Faria, and we are happy to see you at this position. Stay blessed and have more success in your future. So uh, these are the things which I cherish the most. Uh, nobody will remember how good a scientist I am. All these all these things will be remembered. All anything which will be remembered is this. Uh, I am also happy and glad to see you guys. To collaborate with Kip G. Well. Okay, and we uh, have a question also uh, from Dr. Sitwat Zera. Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Sitwat Zera. I'm an associate professor at KIPG. Thank you very much, dear Faria, for this wonderful presentation. And it's really nice to see you and to listen to you after a long time. So I would like to ask that uh, you are doing teaching at Zabist and you did your work at KPG. So what difference did you observe between these two institutions? And can you please suggest us, uh, uh, um, absolutely ourselves and uh, uh, my students, uh, what to do for the betterment of the institute? Thank you, Dr. Sitwet. Thank you for asking this question. I was I really, literally want to answer this question. Uh, yes, uh, if I talk about the institute, yes, it is a research institute and Zebist is Department of Biosciences at Zebist is a department in the university and Zebist is the Imperial University uh, for the management and the administrative sciences, not for the biosciences. Having a department there is a big thing. And obviously, like uh, uh, lack of funds is present everywhere. Everywhere we are facing problems with the funds. We are facing problems for the equipments. We do not have the equipment. The equipments are out of order. Everything is there. Everything is there, just like the KIPG. So in this regard, KIPG and the other same. The only thing which I think, in my point of view, in my opinion, is lacking is the collaboration. The more you collaborate, the more you get a, get good research. Like I have done up. Uh, you cannot find every each and everything in one at one institute. You have to get different institutes for different things. So my only thing is to advise is to get your is, is to collaborate with other institutes and other places like I have collaborated with Akhan, I have collaborated with the uh, with KIPG because uh, because of some equipment, some facilities which are not there at the Abyss, which are present at the KIPG or at Aga Khan. Because in the Abyss, uh, the department is still in the project. It is like a juvenile. Uh, it is like a kid. The department, uh, it hardly took 10 to 11 years that a, a department of biosciences since it is formed. So we have we are still in the phases of phase of establishing. Uh, 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 in spite of that fact, uh, uh, good research and uh, good quality work is being conducted there, and it is all because of the collaborations. And each and every of you can collaborate with different institutes. That's it. That that is only my advice or uh, uh, say in this regard. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Faya. We have an other question from Dr. Sarish Fatma. Uh, Ma'am, you can turn on your mic and ask the question. Assalamualaikum, everyone. I am Dr. Sarish Fatma, and I am working as Faria. It was a nice presentation. Dr. Sarish Fatma, you are. I am not able to hear you clearly. Am I audible now? Yes, yes, you are audible now. Thank you. 
okay so my question is uh, regarding your research like uh, you have done research on uh, breast cancer cells and uh, i want to ask you what uh, hurdles like you have explained all your ups and downs of uh, your research course but i want to know that when you come to the lab like uh, i'm uh, solely talking about the uh, lab experiments wet lab experiments so what hurdles did you face my first question is this that what hurdles did you face when you uh, when you come to the lab and you start performing your experiments number 1 and number 2 and what are your future plans for your research like obviously you are teaching now and uh, you have some upcoming projects you have some ongoing projects but what are your uh, future plans for your uh, research for your own research thank you uh, thank you thank you so much dr sarish uh, the hurdles which i faced during the experimental work was a uh, uh, first hurdle was it was very difficult for me to get the tissue samples uh, um nobody was collaborating or nobody was agreeing or we get the tissue samples which are formally fixed or the paraffin emitted which is a big problem for us to extract the dna and the second hurdle was had heard of was the optimization i optimized right i optimized the dna and then suddenly that equipment got out of order i have to reoptimize that thing then we optimize then we optimize and in this way i have optimized all the primers for approximately 4 to 5 times when after optimization when i did the started the genotyping uh, suddenly one of the set of primers start behaving abnormally it suddenly stopped giving the results uh, then i have to re opt the trouble troubleshoot that problem that why is it happening so that that is probably because of the, that primer was performing the secondary structure and that primer was having the uh, uh, complementarity self complementarity with each other and then with the dna and all. these were the problems which i faced during the experimentation which delayed the lot uh, along with this uh, there were many other things as well as i have mentioned only five polymorphisms of four genes but i have targeted uh, approximately uh, seven polymorphisms and unfortunately i was not able to optimize those two other polymorphisms uh, that is because i probably the one of the error which i thought is uh, the i used the reported primers if i design those primers by myself probably i would be able to optimize um, use of reported primers can be a problem uh, can you please uh, re repeat your second question uh my second question is that uh, what are your future plans for your own research uh, uh like uh, i want to the, as my phd is on breast cancer and different genetic aspects uh, my future plans are also regarding the cancer uh, like i'll go for i try to get or try to uh, uh, work on the different factors as cancer is a multifactorial disease also different factors uh, go for the protein expression then uh, different ways to ex uh, to check the expression of protein and cell culture uh, in different domains of cell culture i can Uh, implement impact of different drugs on the uh, uh, cancer if i if i can do the uh, uh, cancer cell and then check the effect of different drugs uh, along with this uh, uh, if i get the opportunity i would high likely very likely to see for the regenerative medicine which is talking about in pakistan doing the regenerative medicine in pakistan like doing the dream thing but uh, i really want to do that gene therapy and uh, tissue engineering all that so looking forward to get an opportunity to work like that thank you dr faria we have two messages for you one is from akif uh, and he says that good to see you keep it up and second is from dr samina khan she says a uh, well done dr faria great presentation and god bless you okay and we have a very we have a very special special message for you uh 
So over to you, ma'am. Um, having Faria in front of uh, everybody, expressing, saying the words uh, she has experienced, I just would like to say that uh, Faria is just a pride. She is my first PhD student, and uh, the time we ha I've spent with her is just not only the learning as well as joy. And I would like to suggest all the mentors or all the supervisors just, just believe in your kid, whatever he is, go she, he or she might be going to do that. And you can see the product like Faria. Faria, I totally believe in you, always be and will be. I just wanted to have you more success in your life and <clears throat> wish you all the best. I love you. Love you too, ma'am. And same, I wish the same for you. Uh, literally, uh, having a mentor like Dr. Saima is, is, is a big thing for me. Uh, if I can say in Urdu, if she can make me if I can learn, to anyone can learn. She makes a raw product to a refined product. She makes a raw material to the refined product. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. So proud of you. Take care. Thank you so much for coming. Can we have a last question? from Ms. Zunera and she says that she wanted to know what are the future scope of medical biotechnologists instead of teaching that uh, we usually say that uh, the only profession left for PhDs is teaching. So what do you think that uh, in Pakistan, what is the scope for the researchers who just go into the research, not into the teaching? A uh, very good question, uh, Zanera. And this question is usually asked by most of the students. They are who got worried about their uh, future. Yes, and uh, it is justified to ask this question that what is the scope uh, apart from the teaching? Uh, if I uh, if I say that uh, if you are doing uh, if you are achieving a higher degree, like if you're working, if you're getting MPhil or you're getting PhD, there are two major domains for you. Uh, academic, academia, or research. Some people go in both. Like uh, it all depends on your interest. Like I am as interested in teaching as much as I am interested in doing the research. So uh, some people work in both directions, and some people uh, they are how they are they completely go in the academia, they completely go in the research. Along with the research, along with the teaching. The thing which you can work in Pakistan is there are different uh, research labs uh, in a very reputed and uh, very, uh, uh, I would say, equipped uh, hospitals and uh, uh, and people are working there. You can you can have you can work there. Uh, uh, along with this, uh, there is a huge scope of this research in the diagnostics. Currently, I would not say that we are able to apply this research in the uh, in the industrial level, still there are uh, many products, many Pakistani products are available, like uh, different microbial testing products are available, uh, different vaccine, Pakistani vaccines are available. Still there are, uh, and uh, the domain is still, there, there's a huge gap and they, we need to work on that gap. It, uh, you can work on that gap as well. And uh, still that uh, gap, uh, uh, there are many things which can be done at the industrial level. But uh, so far, the two major things is the uh, uh, academia and in research you can work with different hospitals you can work with different diagnostic centers research institutes as a researcher as a good researcher thank you so much dr faria for taking your time and for we have a, it, it was our pleasure to listen to you and Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and for sharing your experiences. Uh, we are really honored and we learned a lot from you and hope to see you and hope to collaborate with you in the future with different projects. Yes. Thank you I'm so much again. Really looking forward to collaborate with you and love to collaborate.
Thank you. Uh, now it's time for our second speaker, Dr. Shagupta Sahar. She is assistant working as an assistant professor at Department of Agriculture and Agribusiness Management. Uh, over to you, Dr. Shagupta. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Shagupta Sahar. Thank you, Arisha, for introducing me. Uh, first of all, I would really like to uh, thank okay so i would really like to thank owsd and kipji for giving me the honor to present uh, on this forum so i will start by sharing my journey very briefly i did graduation in agriculture with the majors of plant protection from department of agriculture university of karachi um, so when I got admission in the field of agriculture, I was oftenly asked about the scope of women in agriculture. Usually the uh, residents of metropolitan cities do not know uh, much about the mainstream agriculture. Whenever we uh, hear this word agriculture, a farmer usually comes in our mind and uh, doing his job in the field. Uh, so whenever we hear this word a farmer who is working in the field we don't think um, anything more about it so i started studying it and it was hard for me to explain much about it when i was a student because i was i myself was uh, gathering information at that time but this constant question um, made me find out its significance more and more so Agriculture is basically a very vast field. It's not only about uh, farm practices, but what to plant, where to plant, how to protect it, how to increase crops productivity, and not only crops productivity, but um, animal productivity and poultry industry and fisheries, they all come in the field of agriculture. So how to save it after after um, harvest and then comes the agribusiness how to pack add value marketing trading it all comes in the field of agriculture so uh, after my graduation after i would say pretty much finding out the significance of agriculture i pursued agri uh, agriculture biotechnology for my uh, masters and for my ms and phd and I completed my PhD in agriculture biotechnology from Dr. A.Q. Khan uh, Institute of Biotechnology and Genetic Engineering. And today uh, I will be discussing about the global issue of food security, which is um, which is highly related to uh, agriculture. So let's begin. So food security is the baseline of human needs. Without it, we, we cannot thrive and we cannot even survive. So according to Food and Agriculture Organization, food security is when all the people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So food security is consistent and reliable access to safe and nutritious food. Why is food security so important? This picture over here is showing the imbalance of food in the global population. Around 35% uh, of uh, the, the population around the world is overweight, whereas 29% has uh, nutritional deficiencies. And interestingly, obese versus undernourished uh, population, the percentages are very close to each other. So these are all the forms of malnutrition. So malnutrition refers to the deficiencies, excesses or imbalances in a person's intake of energy and or nutrients. And the term malnutrition is uh, is mostly 
thought about uh, whenever we uh, say the word malnutrition, a, an undernourished person or an undernourished child comes to our mind. But not only undernutrition, micronutrient related malnutrition and even overweight. As I have told you earlier that malnutrition is uh, is the imbalance of food, whether it be um, overweight or underweight. So the undernutrition, which includes wasting, wasting is a term which is associated to low weight for height. Stunting, stunting is low height for age and underweight is low weight to age. So these are the three categories of undernutrition. Secondly, micronutrient related uh, malnutrition. So it includes micronutrient deficiencies, a lack of important vitamins and minerals or, or micronutrients excess is also uh, included in malnutrition. And the third type of malnutrition is overweight, obesity and diet related non-communicable diseases. So right now when we are sitting uh, in our offices, around 11% of the world's population is still hungry and millions of primary school aged children attend classes with hung hungry stomachs and please note notice that this is the documented data of a school going children and a huge number of uh, this age group remains out of the school so they are far beyond these figures and the world hunger is again on the rise affecting around uh, around 10 percent of people globally so these issues are tied to poverty and uh, this is a vicious circle where uh, the cause has an effect and the effect is the cause of the next problem and as we can see over here poverty leads to hunger and hunger leads to malnutrition and a person whose basic needs and nourishments are compromised he or she will not be able to make money and again this cycle of poverty will start again and it will intensify over time here is the picture of agenda 2030 by united nations uh, in order to uh, solve these grave issues of world hunger you can see the top three priorities are are to ensure food security the number one priority is no poverty then zero hunger and both these things will lead to good health and well-being and the zero hunger which is the priority number two remains one of the most rigorous of the sustainable development goals that the uh, United Nations wants to um, reach by 2030. And there are the rest of the um, 17 most important problems which are recognized by United Nations. So uh, the ranges of food security have been defined. Uh, first of all, high food security, those the people who never had any issue or anxiety about how and where to get their food from, they they are placed on high, they are they are placed as the people who are uh, highly secured in terms of food. Then comes marginal food security. Marginal food security is where people occasionally get insecure about their food supplies uh, but they do not um, do not experience hunger very often then comes low food security so low food security group is associated to the households that are the ones who uh, due to the the threat of hunger they have changed their food demands to very basic ones as they face constant economic crunch and at last very low food security these are the people uh, who not even afford low quality food and those who face constant hunger 
So in order to find out the um, the groups or to uh, make proper divisions, these are some of the food security indicators and managements. So the first indicator, the household food insecurity excess scale. This first indicator is about the sufficiency and the consumption behavior and it is associated with the psychological factors. So by that, I mean that how how um, how much privileged a certain household is and it is very evident by their behavior that whether they have faced hunger or whether they uh, they have never faced hunger. It is very evident by the behavior. The second factor is about diversity. Uh, it is household dietary diversity scale. So it is about the diversity and frequency of food means how often are the different groups consumed in a specific time by by different groups i mean um, dairy meat grains fats and all that these are the different dietary groups so how often a household is able to consume these different groups this is the indicator which tells us about that so the Household hunger scale indicates how often a household goes out of out of food. How often do people sleep hungry? So this particular indicator measures the hunger and at last. The coping strategies index, the CSI is about what measures people take to avoid food shortage. Uh, what are their coping mechanisms? What are their strategies? What are their approaches? Uh, do they uh, shift their dietary groups to very low nutritious food? So these are the uh, four indicators. And after the analysis of these four indicators, the above indicators are used to measure the number and prevalence, uh, prevalence of poor households. So here, this chart shows us that the severely food insecure people, most of them are from Asia and Africa. Um, although a few of the developed nations are also included over here, but their share as compared to Africa and um, Asia is very low. So uh, if we if we focus on Asia where we from where we belong, so 353.6 million people are food insecure in Asia alone. So what are the impacts of hunger and malnutrition on, on the health of individuals? So human bodies respond to constant hunger in multiple ways, specifically by decreasing a body size known as stunting or stunted growth. Once stunting has occurred, even improved nutritional intake is unable to reverse the damage. So stunting itself is a coping mechanism of the body, bringing body size into alignment with the calorie intake, with the food intake. And if, if the expecting mother is malnourished, it leads to higher infant and child mortality. But, um, but as compared to famines, the, the mortality rate um, uh, due to chronic food hunger remains low. So famine is a, is a very adverse condition. In general, the hunger and the constant hunger, the chronic hunger, the food insecurity also leads to infant and child mortality. Um, and uh, a constant or chronic threat of food. And um, even if the food uh, is constantly present, but the food is not nutritious. So it makes the inside of the body very weak. And it is also possible that premature uh, failure of the vital organs can occur. So food 
our food has uh, many important vitamins and many important components that can boost our immunity and uh, uh, low immunity means high risk of diseases and high onset of diseases so these are also the problems regarding uh, hunger and food insecurity so severe malnutrition in early childhood often leads to defects in cognitive development and um, i want you to think about it that already a privileged person has a good lifestyle but the, how how unjustified is this that the the poor ch children will have low iq as well so poor growth and uh, constant fear leads to uh, defects in cognitive development and last but not the least food insecurity is strongly associated with higher risks of depression um anxiety sleep disorders and definitely uh social and behavioral uh, behavioral problems so there are many psychological problems which are interlinked with uh, food security as well now comes to gender specifically i want to i want to bring in your notice that uh, not only food security is a is a global issue but particularly food security is a gender issue as well and uh, gender e equality is described as instrumental uh, to ending malnutrition and hunger but here we can see that in nearly two thirds of countries women are more likely than men to face food insecurity so women are more likely to fa face hunger than men and even um, if if an agriculture land is operated by uh, and uh, governed by a female farmer small scale farmer households headed by women earn on average 30% less so people have uh, the uh, the habit of uh, of not giving uh, the women their their deserved income the the income gap is also there so which also leads to uh, hunger and uh, food insecurity so uh girls and women make up 60% of the world's chronically hungry population and uh women although represent 43% uh in uh, of the agriculture uh, labor and they work in food production processing distribution market uh, marketing uh but still they uh, face discrimination and uh, uh, they are not the the access to land and other facilities and other services are denied to them so in general any group which is vulnerable and oppressed is uh, at high risk of food security and uh, i must draw your attention that uh, it is not much of the issue of our mothers now it is not now our own problem but now it has come to the problem of our daughters the next generations and we all have to um, fight to minimize this gap of uh, hungry women around the world so in order to um, cope up with these problems or or in order to define more precisely about food securities these are the four major components which are availability access utilization and stability and the ultimate goal of uh, all these components is to achieve sustainability the continue process of producing food from 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 uh, continuous process an interrupted process from farm to your table so this is the main goal and when any one of these components are stressed or unmet it is uh, considered food insecurity so we will 
look into these four components one by one first of all food availability so food availability is related to the supply of food through production distribution and exchange so food production is determined by variety of factors which includes land ownership land management crop selection crop production crop protection and uh, crop production can be affected by changes in rainfall and temperatures uh, the use of land water and energy to grow food often competes with other uses of land which can affect food production and food must be distributed to uh, to different regions or to different uh, nations and this distribution involves the storage processing transport packaging and marketing of food along with food chain infrastructures and storage technologies and then uh, the the after the di distribution the exchange of food requires efficient trading not all the countries around the world uh, can produce uh, plenty of food pakistan is blessed in this regard but the efficient trading and uh, the the collaboration of different institutions can uh, can can cope up with this particular problem then we come toward the accessibility so a poverty can limit access to food food security is uh, is extensively related to poverty and uh, it it can not only limit the access to food it can also increase how vulnerable an individual or household is to food price spikes this is called as food uh, food volatility that the um, uh, the inconsistent prices of food the ups and downs in prices affect poor households very much and so the households with enough resources can overcome unstable harvests and local food shortages and maintain their access to uh, food so again uh, the wealthier uh, population can somehow cope up with the uh, with these kind of problems so there are distinctly two types when it comes to access of food the first one is direct access direct access uh is with in uh, in which a household pr produces its own food by using human and material resources and the second one is economic access as i've told you earlier that the uh, wealthier population uh, is likely to overcome the unstable situations so economic access is when a household is able to purchase food which has been produced somewhere else so there are multiple uh, factors that affect the accessibility of food for example the assets of a household uh, the education levels of the family members as well as the gender of the household influences the type and amount of food that is purchased the the gender of the head of the family it also uh, translates what what type of food and what amount of food can be accessed then comes the utilization so the next pillar is the last pillar of uh, food security is food utilization once the food is obtained by a household a variety of factors affect the quantity and quality of uh, food that reaches members of the household in order to efficiently utilize the food the food ingested must be safe so the safe food is very important in terms of the fourth pillar so the food ingested must be safe and must be enough to meet the physiological uh, requirements of each individual and uh, this points out towards one of the major uh, major field and uh, one of the uh, i must say uh, major topics of research that is food safety then after that food choices the nutritional values of the household determine determines food choice or the food choices translates the nutritional values 
Uh, and as uh, I have mentioned earlier, the family hierarchy or how empowered are the individuals even of the same family. It also indicates their food intake and their um, utilization and accessibility of food. So, um, this is the fourth pillar, which is the stability. So food insecurity can be uh, food stability refers to the ability to obtain food over time. Uh, in terms of food insecurity, uh, it can be of three types. That is uh, a tra transitory food insecurity. Food may be unavailable during certain periods of time. Uh, for example, natural disasters and very rare and extreme events. Then uh, the temporary food insecurity is the loss of employment or um, uh, when someone becomes extremely ill, then they face temporary food insecurity. Then seasonal food insecurity can result from the uh, regular growing patterns in food production. And then comes the chronic or the permanent food insecurity, that is the long term uh, persistent constant lack of adequate food. So these were the four pillars of food uh, security and uh, I hope the idea of food security uh, now uh, you are clear about the idea of food security and food insecurity after the discussion about the four pillars. Now if the hunger is rising and uh, um, none of us, I I do know that none of us can see anybody uh, dying, being hungry. So when we have that will to overcome the problem of food security uh, and we somehow have the ways as well. So what are the challenges in achieving food security? So one of the biggest challenge of food security is the uh, population growth. So there's a continue, continuous increase. Um, uh, continuous increase is predicted in population uh, growth in 2017. UN projections show a continuous increase in population in the future. And um, the global population is expected to reach above 9 billion. So the, this, is, this is the grave concern for food security that uh, how to how to feed this this big population a growing population means more mouths to feed simple as that so it has been estimated that we need to produce more food in the next 35 years than we have ever produced in human history so and um, let's consider that we are able to produce that much food we are willing to produce that much food, but would we be able to do, do so because the resources will exhaust. So uh, even if we if we do research about high, high productivity, uh, high, high uh, yield producing crops, where from where we are going to rent out the resources, the extra land, the um, the water, the, the food, the supplies, the resources. So um, although Asia and Africa are the most affected nations in terms of uh, food security, their share in gro global population uh, growth is at top and uh, Asia is uh, winning this race currently. So the second uh, major problem is global water crisis. So water scarcity uh, refers uh, to the lack of fresh water resources to meet the standard water demand. And there are two types of water scarcities. Number one is physical water scarcity. Um, it is uh, where there is not enough water to meet all demands, including uh, that needed for ecosystems to function effectively. And the second one is economic water scarcity. And and this type of water scar scarcity uh, needs to be addressed because 
it is the lack of investment in the infrastructure or technology to draw water from rivers aquifers or other water resources or or insufficient human capacity to satisfy the demand of water and a lot of water uh, is continuously being wasted because we do not uh, have proper proper structure and proper technology to use water efficiently and uh, uh, nor do we have the resources to fund these kind of uh, uh, infrastructure building and technology building so the, this is a this is the major concern regarding uh, regarding food security so uh, and water scarcity has a huge impact on food production without water people do not have a means uh, of watering their crops and therefore to provide food for the fast growing population and uh, this chart over here shows us uh, the red color signifies the the parts of the world which are facing water stre uh, stress um, very aggressively and pakistan is among those uh, red areas after that so uh, the main driving force for the rising global demand of water what are the why why is the uh, we are facing continuous demand of water because first of all the increasing population then changing consumption patterns of energy intensive products again i would like to um, bring into your notice that the the wealthier population has other food demands which are energy extensive the farmers or the have to put more uh, resources to uh, for example to uh, to produce 1 uh, kg of uh, beef now here you can see around 16000 liters is of water is used to produce just 1 kg of uh, beef but on the other hand uh, the uh, the food insecure population which uh, which do not afford beef they are just dying for for one one bread so if we if we compare the um, the uh, water utilized to produce beef as compared to wheat it is just 1500 liters to produce 1 kg of wheat but more fa farmers will be more concerned in producing 1 uh, kg of beef because the wealthier are going to give them high price so this the injustice lies in multiple domains and of course to meet the uh, global hunger to meet to feed the 9 billion population expansion of agriculture leads to high irrigation which in turn leads to uh, water scarcity so around 28% of agriculture lies in water stressed regions and water stressed regions uh, the pakistan as i have shown you uh, just now that it is among the um, severely water stressed regions and the rural families which rely upon producing their own food and water scarcity means they won't be able to uh, directly help themselves and they will lose uh, their their very precious land and again uh, at one hand we have water stress and water scarcity issues and we also have water pollution issues so it is uh, it is very sad that we have a very low amount of water to meet the need, needs and it is also being contaminated by the result of human activities and uh, uh, the industrial activities so we must think about to to stop this water pollution then comes the uh, literally hot topic of of the modern world that is climate change so climate change and agriculture are are totally interrelated processes and both of which uh, takes place on a global scale 
with the adverse effects of climate change affecting agriculture both uh, directly and indirectly so uh, food security in future will be linked to first of all uh, there are a number of adverse effects on agriculture by climate change secondly more floods and a slowly increasing drought is predicted um, as a result of climate change and it will be the test of our adaptability it will be the test of our adaptive agriculture systems that to what extremes we can go um, in adapting ourselves so climate change is 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 um, the test of adaptability of agriculture and uh, already urbanization um, is already a threat to agriculture and climate change will cause again desertification and uh, salination and soil erosion uh, and there are a plenty of there are many ways climate change can affect agriculture we already have uh, the uh, very as compared to the uh, predicted uh, increase in growth we already have a very low amount of precious fertile land and um, it is predicted that we we will uh, unfortunately lose that pre precious land uh, by the adverse effects of climate change so again these uh, this uh, this picture shows which are the most affected parts due to climate change and uh, again unfortunately pakistan is among those uh, adversely affected uh, areas so uh, at one point we are discussing about the importance of food about the increasing of uh, global hunger about the increasing of population growth water scarcity and then that precious food which we intend to produce to not only feed ourselves but to end global hunger it it is being it is being destroyed uh, by multiple biotic and abiotic factors and i want you to to have um, to have a rough estimate in your mind that what according to you is the percentage of this food loss um, by multiple biotic and abiotic factors and i think most of you will be surprised that the amount of food which we produce almost 20 to 40% of that important and precious food is destroyed by these biotic and abiotic factors by the the diseases the pests uh, the virus bacteria fungi and uh, all the other parasites of plants so diseases and not only crops diseases that affect livestock or crop can have devastating effects on food availability especially if there is if if we do not have any aggressive plan or strategy of crop protection so the effects of diseases range from mild symptoms to catastrophes in which large areas planted by food crops can be totally destroyed and any major uh, plant dis plant disease epidemic it can worsen the current deficit of food supply in which at least 800 million people will be affected so we cannot afford and we already have a global pandemic um, of covid-19 and it has affected the uh, food insecurity food security as well as food insecurity very very harshly and we just cannot afford uh, uh, any uh, epidemic of uh, crops so when we talk about diseases the pathogens there are a number of pathogens even plant pathogens that produce uh, some some very 
dangerous uh, mycotoxins and some really dangerous toxins which are uh, very hazardous to in to human health as well so it brings our attention to food safety or food hygiene it is food safety or food hygiene is a method or a discipline uh, describing handling preparation and storage of food in ways that prevent food borne illness and food can transmit pathogens which can result in the illness or even death of the person or animals so the the intricate standards the developed countries have more um, more sophisticated approaches to find out and to overcome the uh, the processes of food uh, the concerns of food safety as compared to the developed nations uh, as compared to the developing nations so if we talk about food contamination food contamination happens when foods are corrupted with another substance so uh, there are multiple processes uh of food production and food consumption um uh, it involves production transportation packaging storage sales cooking processes so contamination can happen at any of these uh, these steps so contamination is can be divided into uh, three types the physical contamination uh is by the foreign bodies or uh, foreign objects such as uh, hair plant stalks or pieces of plastic or uh, the pieces of uh, packaging material if uh, our food is contaminated with these kind of objects we will say that it is physically contaminated then uh, chemical contamination happens when food is contaminated with a natural or uh, artificial chemical substance common sources of chemical contaminations may be uh, pesticides herbicides and uh, there are plenty of uh, natural toxins and uh, there are plenty of uh, additive uh, additives or preservatives or any kind of chemical which is uh, beyond our uh, maximum tolerance threshold then if this amount if maximum uh, tolerance threshold um, uh, is compromised then we can say that the food is chemically contaminated and then comes the biological contamination biological contamination um, can be there in the form of uh, microorganisms in the form of bacterial contamination in the form of uh, any kind of uh, uh, contamination which is related to biological uh, uh, which is related to uh, living organisms for example uh, fecal contamination and uh, uh, red droppings these are all the types of biological contamination which makes the food uh, uh, contaminated and unhealthy for the consumption so bacterial contamination is the most common cause of food poisoning worldwide and after this uh, it is rather it is rather shameful i must say that uh, if people around the globe people thoughtful people around the globe are are trying to trying to overcome the problem of hunger by by their blood and sweat and even if somebody is uh, knowingly or unknowingly wasting this food this is this is very uh, this is a very hopeless attitude and almost 1 billion people are going hungry while we waste about 1/3 of the food we produce and and this partic and this is a behavioral issue and this is a negligence issue and i must say this is this is a criminal negligence because in high income countries most food is wasted at post consumer um time when the food is being sold to the consumer after the consumer gets that food because as compared to developing countries the people of the developed countries are more richer than us so they can not even afford food easily they they can uh, they can bear the the food wastage but 
what about the hungry people so in low income country countries most food is wasted on farm and in post harvest storage and transport because of poor infrastructure because of poor technology because of poor resources so these were although there are uh, more more uh, more challenges to food security like uh, of course many of our problems are related to bad governance and politics and uh, the choice of food uh, the choice of crop uh, like uh, food versus fuel if the global hunger issue is put aside and only the farmers or the land owners want high uh, 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 want more money then they will plant fuel instead of food and the fertile land the uh, the land which was there to produce the food will again diminish so there are multiple other issues so now we will come towards the methods of achieving food security so first of all what can we do we can uh, we can do global partnerships and uh, to help affected governments to help the countries which uh, have high rates of food security uh, issues uh, to help those governments and implement programs that aim to end hunger and malnutrition so uh, an initiative of this kind is food aid uh, food aid programs they are also called as uh, food related transfers it is any intervention and assistance to address hunger and undernutrition so um, in developed uh, con- uh, in developed countries the school children uh, uh, daily they have uh, free lunch in their schools or free breakfast in their schools they have the options of food stamps the uh, uh, as much as the their governments can bear they they subsidize foods for their uh, hungry population then biotechnology can be used to fight food security problems for example uh, biofortification is the process of developing a crop with bioavailable micronutrients in its edible parts and golden rice is uh, the most famous example so now we need to do agriculture smartly we do not have um excess land even our land is uh, facing land degradation urbanization deforestation and all these problems so we must do agriculture smartly uh, there are strong and direct relationships between agriculture productivity hunger poverty and sustainability and uh, we must think about our farmers because unfortunately those people who are who are uh, producing our food who are who are producing the f- food globally they are the they are among the po- poorest of of the whole uh, population so we must do improvements in our agriculture productivity and uh, it should aim at small scale farmers Uh, and the aim should be to benefit the rural rural population first because they are the most affected and growing sufficient food will require people to make changes in conventional agriculture definitely and we must adopt agriculture um, innovations and one of the most important uh, innovation in agriculture is the precision agriculture so precision agriculture is the science of improving crop yields and assisting management decisions using high technology uh, sensors and uh, analysis tools and it is an approach to farm management that uses information technology it inf- it uh, incorporates information it is the collaboration of information technology and agriculture because it ensures that the crops and soil receive exactly what they need and where they need and what amount do they need so the sensors will will precisely um, uh, tell us about uh, about the the requirements of the individual plants then 
I hope everybody uh, have heard a common phrase that prevention is better than cure. So since uh, health and economic damages caused by biotech stress factors are profound, the early and um, easy detection of food contaminants and uh, food pathogens, crop pathogens will allow the farmers to take necessary control measures beforehand. And by using biotechnological tools, the uh, infection of stored, even, even processed food uh, can also be identified. Then after that, uh, well-organized post-harvest practices, that means the uh, proper value addition, the proper preservation practices, uh, after the food has been harvested, these uh, proper practices should be adopted. Then comes the efficient irrigation systems and water saving approaches. So uh, there are a few efficient irrigation systems, for example, drip irrigation system, sprinkler irrigation system, or any innovative irrigation system that specifically and adequately uh, provides water to the uh, water to plants without wasting any any water so uh, during this process as i have told you earlier that because of poor infrastructure the irrigation water is uh, continuously being wasted so this efficient irrigation system will uh, will be a very good approach in terms of ensuring food uh, security and then expert systems so expert systems are the um, as the name suggests the these systems are the disease forecasting systems so what do these systems uh, uh, are uh, what do these systems do they they tell us they tell the farmers about the building up of the favorable uh, situations of the pathogens and this particular field is again related to information technology and the sensors first sense the environment they already have the data um, in the software that which particular disease is favored by which conditions and when they they find out or when they realize that the situations which are favorable to pathogens they are building up they notify the farmers on their cell phones so they can prepare themselves and they can um, come to their farm and they can um, do the uh, proper uh, uh, food uh, crop scouting and uh, prop and take uh, proper measures uh, before the pathogen builds up so um, the development and execution of these all these innovations these will definitely protect the um, crops efficiently and uh, and last but not the least i will say that there should be awareness campaigns and there should be uh, lectures like uh, this to to increase awareness in the general public the public who are not very well aware of these issues so we must promote growing of your own food in your kitchen gardens in your balconies in whatever the space you have you just think of growing one tomato and just think about if every household has produced that one toma tomato or potato or whatever so how many of how much the how much we can be benefited by this practice then we should always try to recycle the agricultural waste this is a very important approach because the agriculture waste can be uh, can be um, converted into a very good compost and that compost will be highly nutritious for for the upcoming uh, for the upcoming plant if we use uh, that compost to plant uh, another new uh, crop so that will be very beneficial and we must we must uh, we must take oath that we will we will not 
waste any kind of food we we should we should uh, change our behaviors we should change our practices we should uh, change our general general knowledge about how to save the wasted food how how we can consume that food if if uh, our food is beyond our consumption how still it can be used to feed for example pets and uh, birds and whatever and then efficient use of water and energy both of these resources the resources are depleting and we want our future generations we want in order to maintain sustainability we have to use these energy resources efficiently uh, to ensure sustainability to end food hunger and to ensure food security so uh, that is all from my side for today and uh, thank you for your patience and thank you for your attention that's it thank you so much uh, dr gupta for such a wonderful presentation and very detailed thank one thank you and we have learned a lot about the food security and the challenges you have mentioned in your presentation so okay thank you risha i would like to ask the audience if there is any question please raise your hand okay we have a question from dr kazim madi uh you can turn on your mic and ask the question okay um <clears throat> assalamu alaikum madam uh, dr oh. shagufta assalamu alaikum assalam dr kazim how are you doing uh, many thanks uh, for the beautifully explaining and highlighting the importance of food and their uh, role in the sustainable development goals particularly in pakistan and uh, my question is regarding the gap the between the current status of science and technology innovations to cope with food security and their application in pakistan for example if we take the example of uh, rice research and shoots in sin so for example rice research in dokri they are responsible to produce uh, uh, quality rice in sin so what are the challenges they are facing what are the status that uh, science and technology they are applying uh, to deal with food security in pakistan and how we can help them because uh, um, what we can do in uh, in this particular area that we can input something to to deal with food security in pakistan um okay kazim um first of all i would say that uh, what what the research institutions are doing i think in pakistan they are doing a good job in terms of uh, combating the issues regarding food security because uh, researchers are continuously uh, doing their their bits continuously they are doing their efforts to 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 lower down the gap to fill the gap uh, as much as they can and uh, one thing i want to say that uh, actually all the uh, especially in pakistan the i i only know about the situation of pakistan so uh, the the gap between industry and the gap between research is in my opinion it is huge it is unfortunately huge not a very small amount of our research which we do is converted into uh, industrial product so even if you talked about uh, rice research institute in sindh the problem of synth is that uh, it is very badly hit by uh, water scarcity so rice is a very water intensive um, uh, water intensive crop so although as much as we uh, we try to 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 make our crop more uh, more 
in terms of uh, producing high yield or disease resistance the the water scarcity issue will will remain the same in in particularly in terms of rice so uh, it is not advisable if we talk about water scarcity it is not advisable to grow rice it is uh, it is it should be uh, it should be planted it should be produced in naturally water fed areas and the second thing is uh, is anybody asking a question okay yes dr shugupta there is a message for you. Uh, yeah, okay. There is a message from Dr. Nozat Nawaf. Uh, he says that thanks, Shagufta, for a very nice and informative lecture. Thank you and so much. We have a message from Tayyaba Asif. Dr. Tayyaba says that a very informative lecture, Dr. Shagufta. Uh, Rimsha also says that it's, it was an informative session. And uh, we have a question from uh, Dr. Bina Siddiqui. She is president of OWSC Pakistan. Okay. And she says that one very important issue of food loss is damage of crops caused by the pests. Biopesticides yes. are a great source of protection, but they are, uh, there are many factors. These are not used frequently. So it is a subject to be discussed as a whole. And she uh, want, would like uh, your opinion on this. Yes, definitely. Um, first of all, many greetings to uh, Dr. Bina. Um, and it is a very important issue among uh, bacteria and viruses and fungi. Biological uh, factors also include uh, pests in terms of uh, uh, pests, including insect pests and uh, other other pests as well. So uh, the biopesticide research is currently going on in many labs, but again, I would say that the commercialization and industrialization gap is huge. Uh, there are many natural herbs. There are many practices from ancient times which are now which we are trying to adopt and we are researching in our labs that which plant repels which kind of insect. And it is it is the wisdom of old aged uh, women that uh, these are the the household what do i say i i had to i'll have to use uh, a urdu word totkas that uh, put this particular thing in the jar of uh, sugar put this particular thing in the jar of rice and pests will go away and these things happen but we have to we have to take up take these things very seriously and we have to uh, we must do a productive research Every research is, is important, but in my opinion that in, in this is my personal opinion that uh, whatever we do, we in agriculture, we should we should come up with more ideas uh, which will make new and better products. So the product uh, research should be done and the biopesticides there should be more options on the shelves of pesticides um, which are bio based and which are botanicals so more botanicals should be used to control pests and if not um, if it is not practical to use the botanicals or biopesticides uh, or biocontrol agents in the fields then in small orchards or in household management the regular chemical pesticides should be um, should be changed to uh, biopesticides and botanicals uh, thank you dr shagupta uh, we have another question from sitra kavar she uh, want to ask that is there any genetic modified crop in pakistan to combat with malnutrition like golden rice actually we are the producers of rice and uh, a lot of our produce is uh, is imported to european countries and in europe particularly there is zero gm tolerance so uh, we are not allowed in pakistan the policy of pakistan do not allow us to make gm rice it is only and only restrict restricted 
to uh, the research point of view. But uh, as I've said uh, earlier that our research should be product oriented. And if our product is already of a special, uh, our product uh, is very special. If we talk about rice, we have a specialty rice. So we do not need currently uh, a GM rice in our in our country because if our if our uh, consumer that is European country finds that we are doing some research or we are planting GM rice, they have zero tolerance policy. They will stop buying from us, and this will lead to a huge foreign uh, loss, the huge loss in foreign exchange. So this is the reason we do not market or we do not commercially plant uh, GM rice. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shugupta. Uh, we also have another question from Dr. Nuzat Nawat. Uh, she wants to ask, actually she have two questions. So her okay. first question is that what are, what are the cognitive developmental uh, defects? And her second question is, uh, can you please define what is oppressed group? Oppressed groups. OK, first of all, the cognitive development effects. See, uh, malnutrition leads to many weaknesses inside of our body. If the body is responding um, in a very visible change, that is a stunted growth. So it will definitely uh, consume less energy in the thought process, in the in the brainstorming processes or the neurological processes. So uh, it is a general perception uh, that uh, I, I wouldn't say general perception, but it is it is clearly uh, it is a clear difference between the uh, groups which are malnourished. See, first of all, we cannot understand anything unless and until our stomachs are full. This is a this is all of us know that. And just think about the thing that if someone is facing chronic hunger, they are constantly thinking about food. So will they be able to uh, analyze and will they be able to uh, make intelligent decisions or intellectual discussions? They won't be able to do so. So generally, there are many uh, cognit uh, cognitive uh, disruptions or disturbances. And secondly, oppressed. General oppressed groups, oppressed means those people who are vulnerable, those people who are generally deprived of the essential essential needs, essential human needs. So any of the groups, whether uh, be it very poor uh, people, be it generally women in uh, in uh, in poor households, specifically women. So uh, as I've said in my discussion that uh, the individual empowerment even in the in in the household it tells us that who will get the most nutritious food this is a this is a rule of thumb i would say so the the general women empowerment and the general financial stability of women is very important Okay, we have another question from uh, Harim Shaheen. She wants to ask about the nano fertilizers. She says that nano fertilizers are the current topic in sustainable agriculture for good plant yield and reducing the soil contamination. So what is the scenario in Pakistan for nano fertilizer? Is there any research going on? Uh, not, uh, I, I don't, uh, I'll have to look up for it because uh, I am not uh, I'm not collaborated or uh, I would say I haven't met any of such group which is uh, doing nano uh, uh, fertilizer research but I'm sure that the department of uh, the uh, Institute of nano nanotechnology it is uh, uh, in ICCBS and uh, they must be doing something uh, regarding uh, this nano fer fertilizer and uh, generally fertilizers which can improve crop yield uh, it will definitely uh, stop or ameliorate the impact of uh, adverse food security issues
Okay, we have another question from Dr. Faria Fatma. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shagulta, for such a nice and informative uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I have a very basic question. Since genetic maintaining the genetic biodiversity is very important, mm. uh, if you just say, uh, usually GMOs are not a preferred uh, choice. Yes. So, is there any regulatory authority in Pakistan which controls this about, uh, or we are dependent on the developed countries or uh, or the authority of those developed countries in this regard? Um, Faria, can you please explain your question? Uh, are you asking about uh, the the quality assurance or the? Um, please kindly explain your question. Uh, like a uh, use of genetically modified organisms i'm not talking about the plant specifically is not a preferred choice throughout the world yes uh, and there are different regulatory authorities in the developed uh, countries which regulate the use and misuse the uh, production of these genetically modified organisms so is there any regulatory authority present in pakistan or currently functional uh, which uh, regulate the use of this, these GMOs? See, there are departments of plant protection we, uh, which uh, deal with these uh, quarantine and regulatory, um, all these kind of issues. But uh, uh, I should be uh, I should be honest that even if there is any kind of regulatory authority, uh, there is not much control about it because one of the reason is that in developed countries if we compare our situation with developed countries their farmers are a lot more educated than our farmers they are very concerned what they are eating they are very they 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 implement and they emphasize that consumer rights should be implemented they want uh, whether the product has any uh, they want written on the labels that whether a whether a product has any traces of GMO or not. But in Pakistan, I I don't think I don't know even even a very small amount of uh, there would there would be very small amount of people who just turn around the package and read the nutritional require nutritional calories in uh, a certain product or uh, what it's made up of it's a very small fraction of our population so our farmer is very uh, very innocent and uh, they are not educated and they do not know what they are planting unless and until their landowner says them to do so they will do so or uh, if this kind of information or if this kind of education um, if a progressive farmer uses this kind of uh, education or this kind of knowledge uh, then only they would know but uh, our general farmers do not know about it and uh, as i've told you that uh, the rice is is very much protected because of that uh, inflow uh, of uh, foreign exchange. Otherwise, other plants or other other things are not very much protected and not very and not tested uh, in terms of whether they are GMO or not. Thank you, Dr. Shagupta. Thank you for such an elaborative answer. I have a very special message for you. Dr. Sadia, please turn on your mic. Okay. Dr. Sadia, over to you. I can't hear you, Dr. Sadia. Dr. Sadia here. Mm -hmm. Are you hearing me? It's a really wonderful talk, Dr. Shagofta. It's a really uh, proud moment for me to comment on my star students. 
on this forum. <laughs> I'm really proud of you that you overcame the challenges related research and completely task always. You not only meet my expectations, but always go beyond that to set an example for others, really. Okay, you are talking about the food security issues, okay? I just want to know what is the connection between food safety and food security? Because both are complementing aims for achieving freedom from hunger. Yes. And I believe that there is no food security without food safety. Yes. Because if food is available and not safe, then it is useless. So yes, what to exactly. think, being an agriculture biotechnologist, what should be our strategy to overcome this challenge? Please comment on it. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your kind uh, remarks, Dr. Sadia. You have always been very gentle and kind, especially with me. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, regarding food safety, uh, my prime interest is also regarding to food safety and the importance of food safety because uh, uh, the, the new diagnostic tools there we should come up with new diagnostic tools we should uh, come up with new approaches and uh, a, a, a term in medical science is used uh, is often used point of care that means where a certain patient is the care or the treatment should be provided at, at that place but when we talk about uh, problems regarding uh, regarding crops then first we have to visit the field, we have to take the sample, we have to take it to the lab, we have to test it and then the report will come and we will come to a conclusion. So it is a it is a long process. So now some some adaptations or some approaches should be taken up by the scientists or by the plant protectionist that whenever or wherever our plant feel the the stress from a biotech factor, the the diagnostic shoe, uh, the diagnostic tool should, uh, the diagnostic tool should be uh, that much capable that it tells you right in the field that what is the problem with your plant. So there are many different approaches because uh, the uh, when we talk about food safety, for first we have to make sure that whether the particular food item is contaminated, then we will come to the cure for that. And as I've told you, the whole process is so lengthy. So it often um, goes, the problem uh, aggravates uh, when uh, when the whole problem uh, is, uh, when the whole process is uh, completed. So we have to, in terms of ensuring food safety, we have to come up with uh, new diagnostic tools, the tools which can be implemented uh, right in the field by the farmer and the tools which are very easy to interpret because mostly all the diagnostic tools, uh, most of the diagnostic tools need uh, supervision of the experts and then they and then the consumer will get the answer whether the uh, the thing is uh, whether our sample is contaminated or not contaminated, diseased or healthy. So the tool should be efficient enough to do the right job and yet it should be it should be easy to interpret that even a layman can tell um, the answer in the field that yes this plant is infected by this pathogen or uh, it is not it is not infected by by the uh, predicted pathogen i hope that answers okay, your question yes, yeah, so, yes dr dr shivta you are right you are very right in this scenario because we should focus on research for emerging technologies for real-time testing of high level of contaminations yes, in exactly. foods and crops as well. Let me pose our public health in this, in this regard. Okay, Dr. Jugurta. Thank nice you to so see much. You again. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sadia. Uh, now I would like to uh, request Dr. Sitra Zaira to please conclude our, the whole session or to give her remarks and to also deliver the special message from Dr. Veena Padikhi. Thank you, Arisha, and thank you, Dr. Shagupta. Thank you so uh, much. For this interesting and informative lecture. I really appreciate and I love to listen both the speaker after a long time. 
now uh, i am giving you a message on behalf of dr beena siddiqui president o w s d pakistan chapter she said i would like to congratulate both the speaker dr faria fatma and dr shagufta sahar for such a wonderful and provoking lecture which can contribute for the benefit of country and it also encourages young researchers to make their careers in their respective field heartiest congratulations thank you so much thank, thank you, you so much so nice of you thank you so much dr shagupta thank you so much dr sisma uh, with this we have come to the end of the session would you like to say anything uh, dr shagupta at the end okay i think we'll lost the connection thank you so much for all the attendees uh, and making this uh, a wonderful session for all of us uh, we see you in our next upcoming sessions and please stay tuned on our social media platforms and uh, whatsapp groups as well thank you so much allah hafiz take care